This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Get $50 off your first job post at linkedin.com slash twist. Trends by The Hustle. Track and capitalize on emerging industries and trends before they explode. Start your two-week trial for just $1 at trends.co slash twist. And Silicon Valley Bank. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped thousands of tech and life science companies plan for the future. Learn more at svb.com slash next. Silicon Valley Bank. Built for what's next. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. We've got a great show for you today. With us today is Reeves Weideman. He uh, recently authored Billion Dollar Loser, uh, which is the story of Adam Newman, uh, the ta- the uh, subtitle, The Epic Rise and Spectacular Fall of Adam Newman and WeWork. It's a very straightforward book written in narrative fashion without too much judgment, a little bit of judgment on the on the margins, but... Reeves, welcome to the program. I guess when you're writing a book about Adam Newman, you don't need to actually uh, embellish or, I mean, just telling the story straight, he's insane. And you never say he's insane, but the behavior is so insane, deranged, inappropriate, that it just sort of, the story tells itself, right? Yeah, I think there's a sense of, just wanting to play it straight here and, and yeah. that reality was was much stranger and weirder and more interesting than than fiction could be. So you just kind of have to get out of the way and let let Adam's both his words and actions kind of do the talking. Now, you uh, were writing for The New Yorker and New York Magazine when you mm-hmm. started covering him. I don't think you covered him at The New Yorker, but you did start at New York Magazine. Is that correct? Yeah, back in back in the spring of 2019 at, at New York Magazine. Got it. So he was well on his way to getting kicked out of the company. Uh, and you had access to him, correct? Well, at, at that point, he was still flying high. So this was actually sort of a year and a half ago, early 2019. Um, the company was just recently worth um, $47 billion, at least decreed by by SoftBank and had just um, in, came up with its mission statement of... Um, elevating the world's consciousness and and the ipo actually hadn't even been announced yet and that's when i met adam was kind of at this point where he was still talking about you know our growth is going to be uh bigger and faster than amazon's um and and still sort of flying high was when i had my audience with him got it uh and then in terms of when you're writing a book like this how many people do you wind up talking to to be able to construct the narrative correctly and we'll get into the narrative of course but i'm just sur- curious setting the table here because it's your first book how yep. long does it how many hours and how many people do you have to talk to to really make sure you have an accurate picture of what happened yeah um a lot uh, and that's kind of the only way to to do these kind of books, especially about these companies that become so big and sprawling. Um, ultimately, I talked to somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 people, um, and that goes for employees all the way from kind of the lowest level junior people all the way up to the most senior people at the company. Um, some of the investors who who invested in WeWork over the years, landlords. This was obviously a company that really interacted with various people um and and various industries um and some of those conversations were four five six hours long i mean it it, it, especially i think yeah and and once once things went wrong i mean this was a a defining experience for so many people who who worked there and and a lot of them sort of told me they treated our conversations as kind of therapy sessions where they just got to sit there and kind of talk through what they had experienced yeah, and I see Ken Al- uh, Aletta gave you a blurb on the back of the book, and he's a great storyteller and gets people yeah. to talk. Did he mentor you in any way in terms of getting the story to paper? It, he didn't. So, I, you know, I, my, my relationship with Ken, is, with Ken is I, I started out as a fact checker at the New Yorker magazine where Ken has worked uh-huh. for a long time um, and, and worked with him there. So, you know, uh, in an unofficial way, I, I got to sort of see the way that, that he works and, and, you know, you you realize that to get these kinds of stories to be as rich and detailed as you want them to be, it, it all comes down to, can you talk to the right people and, and as many people as, as you can to sort of fill in all these details? 
the fact checking at the New Yorker is a legendary uh, position and a process. Yes. Yeah, uh, having I had a story written about me by Larissa McFark back in the day uh -huh. and went through it. Uh, Were you? How was your fact checking experience? It was extraordinary because I I think it was two different people contacted me and they, maybe they contacted me three different times mm. and you know it was everything from do you have a bulldog and can you spell the bulldog's name uh, do you live at this address do you know this person and when you're the subject you're kind of trying to figure out like well who did they talk to and where did this come from and then you you don't really have the ability to say the person who said that or where did you yeah. get that from so you kind of get into this little bit of a dialogue like what do you mean by that and did you say this and it felt like it was like a very um uh they were trying to get the facts straight without telling me what the story would be who the subjects were and I, it, it was actually i felt very good about it because the only other time i had that type of fact checking done was in wired magazine mm-hmm and the times I've been in the New York Times or since when I get mentioned, I get mentioned in a story in the Atlantic or New York Magazine, and there's no fact checking. Nobody ever, journalists don't even call you to tell you, they don't even give you a heads up you're going to be in the story now. So things well, have the, changed radically, I guess, because the budgets don't exist anymore to do fact checking. Yeah, the, the good correct? ones still do. And, uh, you know, uh, with New York Magazine, we, we have fact checkers and it, you know, but the budget is hard and people would often ask me like sort of, you know, what's, what's the secret uh, to the New Yorkers fact checking? Mm. And, uh, you know, how, how do you guys do what you do? And the reality of it is manpower. It's, you know, they, there yeah. is uh, a sort of army of, uh, I, I think this might be outdated, but when I was there, there were 16, 17, 18 fact checkers who, who fact check every, wow. uh, every word of, of, uh, of, of anything that went in the magazine, even the cartoons. Um, and, wow. and we did go through a fact checking process on, on the book, um, book publishers do not have fact checkers, uh, on staff. It sort of is, um, incumbent on the writer to choose to have a fact checker if they want. And, and I like that part of the process. I would rather go back to you, Jason, and say, here's what I'm saying. Here's sort of why I'm saying it. Is this, is this right? And both a fix any mistakes and kind of give you or whoever it is a, a chance to you know, add yeah. some context and, and in some cases, uh, sort of add, add even more interesting context. My understanding back then was the fact checkers got paid like 30 or $40 an hour of the freelancers. What does a fact checker get paid to you if you would take a guess at a, a New Yorker or a, a publication on that scale, like a Condé Nast publication? When I joined... Per hour? When, when I joined the company, I was on staff and I believe I was making something in the neighborhood of $40,000 a year. So, you know, in New York Got City, it. it's, you can survive, um, but, uh, that know, was 10 years a, ago. Uh, it was, was about that 10 years ago. 2010 time period? Uh, yeah. right around then. Yep. When, when I came into the workforce in 1993, it was 500 <laughs> bucks a week, I think, Condé Nast and those kind of places. So it was 30,000. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> people who okay, think that so these journalism a little jobs better. get paid a lot is, <laughs> you got a little, it literally went up 10,000 in 15 years. It's crazy, I know. Right? You, yeah, um, it's it 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 is um it's a tough business, uh, unfortunately. Since we're on this subject, and I think this inside baseball is just absolutely fantastic, and I appreciate you um delving into it. Sure. Um what do you do when two different subjects or three mm. different subjects have a Rashomon moment and it's three versions of the truth, right? And everybody's looking yeah. at it from their perspective. Yep. Um and did you have what's an example of a moment like that and then how do you referee it it's hard and especially you know writing a book about this you know the the early events i mean the the events go back to adam newman's childhood in in some ways um or, or at least in, in at the beginning of the book and you know the founding of WeWork was was 10 years ago and um you know there was a <laughs> i mean to, to pick sort of a minor uh, example um there's a moment in the book where uh, you know, Adam is giving kind of a, a a talking to to WeWork's early employees, saying you need to dress better. Like you're you're wearing these schlubby T-shirts and and cargo shorts, and we need to look professional. And you know, one of the employees kind of points to Adam and said, "But Adam, you like you're wearing a T-shirt and jeans." And Adam says, "Yeah, well, my T-shirt costs two hundred dollars. Um, it's a nice T-shirt. It's this is and not the kind James of T-shirt you wear. Exactly." Yeah, and it's a James Purse t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. And so he, anyway, like that was just a moment. And, and I, I heard that from, from one person who sort of 
told me the story um, as, as a particular employee having said it. And then I talked to someone else and I, I didn't even bring it up and they just told me the same story unprompted, but it was a different person who was asking the question. Uh, eventually, uh. I, <laughs> this was not the most important point in the book, but I did talk to, right. at one point, three different people who were there and remember it. And the first guy who remembered it one way, when I came back to him and said, you know, these other people remember it this way, that he was kind of like, yeah, you know, I, I mean, my memory's a little foggy and I, I, think, that, I think that might be right. So, so it's and a sort of triangulation about, game. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you're you you do the best you can in terms of representing, you know, what happened because it's you know it's now it's the first it's kind of the first draft of history, right? Like the the magazine article then morphs into the book, and you know then people write subsequent books, and these things kind of get cemented. Uh, we'll get back from this quick break. I, I want to talk about what was the viable part of the business, and when mm -hmm. you felt the business, or you know, when you're telling the story, the first indications that. Adam was getting disconnected from the reality of what was a profitable and promising business in the early days when we get back on This Week in Startups. The colorful days of fall are now upon us and your small business needs to evolve despite the current uncertainty having the right people on your team. It's that feeling of just putting that warm blanket on, having a little hot cocoa. And when your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so you can find the right person quickly. LinkedIn has over 706 million members worldwide. Think about that, over 700 million members worldwide. And getting started is easier than ever with new features to help you find qualified candidates quickly manage job posts and contact candidates from a single view in that familiar linkedin.com interface you know how to use it all the functions are streamlined into one simple screen you get these nice email updates when you got candidates and everyone on the team is on the same page super important when it comes to recruiting you can identify strong candidates with their efficient rating system to help you get your job in front of more qualified candidates. And now you can do all of this from your mobile device, no matter where the day takes you. So you spend a little bit of money, you get a lot of great candidates and you solve your problems quickly. Hiring is brutal, hiring is arduous, hiring is time consuming, unless you use LinkedIn jobs. Here is your call to action. When your business is ready to make that next hire, I want you to go to LinkedIn jobs and you will get $50 off that first job posting. Go to linkedin.com slash twist, linkedin.com slash TWIST and get 50, 50 $50 off your first job posting. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because LinkedIn's giving you that $50. Uh, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back to This Week in Startups. The book is Billion Dollar, Lo Billion Dollar Loser. Reeves Weidman is here to talk about it. It's a great book. Um, and I listened to the audio book. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks for getting me an early copy of it. Um, but I did buy the book. I got a copy of it here. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, of course. And it's out today, uh, the day we're taping this, but this might be coming out the next day. So um, in the book, there is this uh, first version of... We work that many people don't know about, mm -hmm. which was Green Chair, which was going to be like an eco friendly co working space. Adam had two partners on it. He had talked a landlord in Brooklyn into giving him the space, and it worked really well. Gothamist, uh, the blog was sort of um, housed out of there, and it went so well that the landlord bought out Adam and his partners. Tell that part of the story because I think it's instructive that. This was a great moment in time to create this very innovative idea of, you know, offices as a service. We look at like one of the big, when, when we used to raise money for companies, the first thing you did was like buy some servers. And the next thing you did was sign a two-year lease and then yeah. wonder if you had signed for too much or too little. And this was right. a pretty innovative idea, was it not? It was. And, and this was coming out of the financial crisis of, of 2008. Um, it was actually sort of right in that. And it, it, in some ways, it felt like a bad moment. But in, in hindsight, it was, it was kind of perfect because you had all these people looking for, for different solutions. You had companies downsizing. You had a lot of freelancers. And as, as the company grew, as you know, yeah, they had Green Desk for about a year. Um, oh, Green Desk, not Green Share, yes. Green, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, different... I mean, the funny part about it is there was also a, a, 
uh, half a mile away a place called Green Spaces that was basically doing the same thing. So there was this little kind of boomlet of of these companies where it was like, yes, the real estate world does not seem to be meeting the demands and specifically the, the demands of the startup world, which was uh, right now I might have two people next year i might have 20 or i might still have two like i don't i don't totally know and and so what we were provided was you know beyond what everyone talks about which was the beer keg and and the coffee and the nice place to kind of meet was flexibility and you could have different offices of different sizes um you could do a month to month lease you could you just had had a lot more uh, adaptability to whatever sort of your your needs were so I think for a long time, and especially as kind of the startup world was really getting going again after the financial crisis, it really served a, a pretty pretty clear need for that community in particular. And it was so profitable and valuable, that green desk, that the landlord, um, yeah. who owned many buildings in Brooklyn, said to Newman and his partners, I want to give you $500,000 each and buy you out. And this is after yeah. one year, so that yeah. I own 100% of this. So it was confirmation that this was a brilliant idea. It was working. And he said, just stay the hell out of Brooklyn. Uh, you have a non-compete to stay out of Brooklyn. One of the three partners went back to Israel, was like, yep. I'm, I got my 500. But he talks the other founder into, hey, let's start WeWork and find another space mm -hmm. and start again in lower Manhattan, correct? Yeah. And Green Desk uh, still exists. I'm here in Dumbo right now. And, and it's, it's still here a few blocks away. And, and that landlord went and expanded it into half a dozen spaces in Brooklyn. and. And what Adam and his, his co-founder, Miguel McKelvey, sort of said was they wanted something bigger. They, wanted, they, they didn't want to just stay in Brooklyn. And, and they also wanted to run their own business. They didn't want to necessarily be a, a, a partner or, or sort of, oh, this landlord as, as kind of the, the person who, who had the space. So they, the, it was clear the idea had legs. Um, the tricky part was was sort of still convincing kind of landlords to take a risk on on this company because it was sort of a, a risky model. It had existed before, and especially in recessions, which we were in at the at the time, it's 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 a potentially dangerous model because if you can't find people to rent your little offices out of, you're still on the hook. And and people had had gone under in the past from this very same sort of idea. In the dot com boom, we had another company, uh, Regal. Yep. Regis. Regis, that was it. Regis. Yep. And they had gone public, became worth a couple yep. billion dollars. And they had the same exact story, same which idea. is same idea and same story, which was, hey, if there's a recession, then all these big companies need to get smaller and they need to downsize and freelancers need to get out of their house and have a place to work, which turned out to be complete utter nonsense. Yeah. And when there's yeah, a recession, I there's too much space and it's everywhere. And, you know, it's like the market is flooded. Uh, you know, and there's just no way to have a viable business if you were subletting. Yeah. And, and for a lot of people watching the WeWork story, it felt like deja vu. I mean, you can go back and we mentioned in the book in, in 2000, there was a fast company profile of Regis called Office of the Future. Mm. And like everything about it, you could basically take all the words and take Regis and replace it with WeWork. And that's what people were saying 10 years later. And so people in the real estate world were you know, couldn't understand why there was this sense that WeWork had figured something new out. I mean, they, you know, they saw that if you looked at a Regis space, it was bland, it was, you know, white walls and, and kind of boring decor. And, and WeWork was clearly different and trying to be something different, but it was in a sort of a branding sense, not, not in a changing the whole economics of, of the business. Yeah, Regis was known as having like, dorky spaces yeah and they were they were not made of glass the thing that was unique about we work was i i think in terms of the design it wasn't an open floor plan which people thought was the best model but that kind of sucked because you were constantly getting interrupted it yeah. was closed offices but they were all glass but they were micro so this was actually a, another great innovation of i think his model which was you you get to have you know, you, you get to feel like you're part of something, the whole kibbutz thing, like, yeah. he, he grew up on a kibbutz, which I think we could explain to people who don't know, but it's basically a commune in Israel where everybody yeah. shares jobs and they everybody gets paid the same amount. It's kind of like a socialist thing. Um, yep. And I mean, this is the kind of hypocrisy that I think comes out in the book without you pointing it out, like, explicitly by like tapping your 
teacher's, you know, uh, stick on the chalkboard. But yeah, learn the lesson, kids. Yeah, he was a total hypocrite. Like he was telling everybody to live in this communal way, but he was cashing out his stock every chance he got and living a crazy lifestyle. Yeah, and and you know, there there is a level at which I I, I wondered about that hypocrisy and and wondered if it was kind of all BS as as he was talking about, you know, we, we want to change the world and and make people's lives better. And I came to believe he he believed that that, that he did hmm. think that WeWork was doing that. Um, that it wasn't just sort of a PR shtick. Um, he he Adam came to believe that that he himself and and WeWork as a, as a company were sort of uniquely positioned to solve various kinds of problems of course it, it it does become hypocritical when when you're talking you know talking about uh as as he and his wife rebecca newman did living an asset light lifestyle um you know, along with having an asset light business although in WeWork's case it was very asset heavy business um there just there was this hypocrisy that I think weighed on the company um, once it became clear that you know they had a sixty billion or excuse me sixty million dollar uh, jet and seven homes and kind of all these instances of excess at the company that didn't totally jive with the message that they were saying publicly. So, at what point do you feel like in telling this story he got disconnected from the reality of running the business, uh, which was basically a, a solid non-technical business but a good business that could have a decent margin not a killer margin yep. but it was an innovative product certainly there was demand for it it was profitable he had sold the previous version of it this is all check boxes on the way i mean there was product market fit here no doubt there was some level of margin here and there was obviously things that could be built on top of this like big companies being involved and community and maybe a network you know, on the margins could be interesting, or maybe yeah. people could sell into this group of people or having this, you know, the Frappuccino in every city is the same, the Uber experience in every city is the same, there's some value to that, yep. that anybody who goes to a WeWork in Tokyo, or London, or New York, or San Francisco has the same experience. So th those things all added up to me. When did in your mind was the the disconnect from reality starting? I, I think there's sort of two points, um, one that leads up to the next. And, and the first one gets at the idea you hit at of creating this network. And around, around 2012, Adam started talking about the company as a physical social network, that we're not a real estate company. We're creating this network of buildings where, you know, they kind of try, we were tried to sort of create a, what they called a member network. It was sort of a internal proprietary LinkedIn. Of course, the problem was LinkedIn exists. LinkedIn is good for what it is there wasn't it wasn't necessarily clear what kind of what was the tech aspect that that adam clearly wanted the company to have what would that actually be and and so that pushed the company into this kind of you know they were of the startup world and then they kind of wanted to be of this silicon valley sort of tech boom and that all sort of led up to this moment where you get to 2016 um, the company's growing still uh, pretty exceptionally every year, year over year. Revenue is doubling. Um, they're growing all over the world, but they're running out of money. They're running out of the venture capital. They've tapped everyone from from Benchmark in Silicon Valley to a lot of banks in New York to an investor in China. And it's not clear where they're going to go next. And and there was kind of a moment where they were thinking of going public um, in in kind of 2016 that that you know they didn't at least explored it because they knew they they needed more money to to continue their expansion and then SoftBank showed up and uh, Masayoshi San met Adam Newman um, and after a half an hour meeting decided to give him uh, four billion dollars to uh, supercharge WeWork's growth and I, I think many WeWork employees told to me you know looking at that moment. In hindsight, we wish that had never happened and that mm. that sent the company on a trajectory that was was unsustainable and kind of enabled some of the worst impulses. I mean, I, you know, to take a pause for a second, Adam deserves a lot of credit for for how big WeWork got. I mean, you know, he and Miguel had this good idea. Um, they pushed it uh, as far as they could. Um, they were ambitious. Um, eventually, once he had a sort of near limitless supply of money, um there was uh you know some problems started to emerge all right when we get back from this quick break i want to know how he made that jump from the benchmark money which we would call in the valley like the smartest money in the room obviously mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then having this 
unlimited pool of resources and how he was actually uh, convinced Masayoshi-san to make a $4 billion bet and to scale this thing when we get back on This Week in Startups. I want to tell you about a great online community that I recently joined. It's called Trends, and it is the ultimate knowledge hub from the folks at The Hustle. You know that newsletter. Their CEO, Sam, was back on this very podcast in May. Super smart, candid guy. If you follow him on Twitter, you know he's really intelligent. He likes to mix it up. Um, and I just love what he's built, Trends. It is the ultimate knowledge hub, as I've said. I love their recent analysis on the $1 trillion age tech market. What's that? That is the market for senior citizens and influencers in the lucrative 55 and older demographic. You probably don't think about them, but Trends does, and they do that analysis for you. And they're going to give you the network and information you need to succeed, get access to a community of industry leaders in virtually every field. You'll be able to workshop ideas and network with other founders and investors. And they also have weekly live lectures with experts who teach things like growth strategies, SEO, and how to send the perfect cold email. Trends has exclusive research with intriguing topics to help educate and inspire like their 30 companies defining the future of media and pop culture or data on thousands of successful Kickstarter projects. So here's your call to action. It's a very simple one. I want you to join the Trends community and you can do that right now and get your first two weeks for just $1. Go to trends.co. It's a great domain name. Congratulations on getting that. And you can start your $1 trial by going to trends.co slash twist. Very important you go there, trends.co slash TWIST to get your $1 two-week trial. Got nothing to lose there. Trends.co slash twist. You're going to love it. Uh, go check it out. And let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Uh, the story gets crazy. Uh, and it's only going to get crazier <laughs> from this point on because we are reaching the point in Billion Dollar Loser, uh, a great book, must read, uh, from Reese Weiderman, uh, Reeves Weiderman, sorry. Um, that uh, comes out uh, today, or maybe when you're watching this yesterday, well mm -hmm. worth getting. It's a great listen too, by the way, if you're into listening to audiobooks and it moves pretty quickly. And uh, as we talked about earlier, you basically made the strategic decision to let the facts speak for themselves. And really, the fact is, it was a good business, maybe not a great business, not a tech business, with a founder who was, you know, effervescent, mercurial. Um, but then quickly, who I'll use the word, became deranged and disconnected from reality. And as far as you estimate, this happened when that $4 billion infusion comes in. And to set the stage here, Masayoshi Yoshi-san, I've met with him, uh, actually, when I went to Tokyo, I met with him day, two, hour, two times back to back, three hours each time. I mean, he <laughs> is an intense guy. Mm -hmm. um, and he loves ideas and he loves whiteboarding. But am I correct that Adam showed up late for his meeting with Masayoshi-san? And do you know if this happened in New York or in Tokyo? Uh, the other way around, actually. Masa was late. Um, Masa, Masa was a, late. Masa was late. He had an okay. interesting day in New York. This was December of 2016, um, which if we can go back to that moment almost four years ago, uh, Donald Trump had just been elected president. And, and the reason ah. Masa was in New York uh, was to meet with Donald Trump, um, it, basically in hopes of currying favor um, with the Trump administration for a variety of things that that's all. Well, was this the whole lobby out. thing where everybody during that like two month period before the inauguration was going to kiss the ring in the lobby in and front Masayoshi, of the gold elevators? Oh yeah. God, that was so brutal to watch everybody go kiss the ring, and then I think Masayoshi San comes out with like some like piece of the PowerPoint and holds it up and. Trump had signed it or something. I can't remember. Yeah, I had a it was like a, it was a yeah, it was a piece of paper saying I'm 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 may butcher these numbers, but but something to the effect of we want to invest fifty billion dollars to create X amount of jobs. And we're going to do uh, it in the next four years uh, in the United States, conveniently tied to uh, Trump. The, the term yeah. of of at least one presidential term. Interesting. I wonder actually if you go back and look at how much he invested. If it actually turned out to be fifty billion, I think there, it's it's definitely it's definitely tens of billions. That's for sure. If there's an interesting, uh, I, I uh, among all the things I had to do for this book, the one one question I wanted to look back on and and haven't yet. So if there's any enterprising journalists out there or or, or anyone who wants to tally up how much um, SoftBank actually invested in the United States, how many jobs were created, because that was the promise, and I, I, yeah. I'd be curious to see see what the answer actually is. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not, it, it, it might be half. It's not small. Uh, 
yeah it's, it's not, not small, small. so yeah. um so that was the crazy day so he gets yeah so he 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 meets he meets Trump and 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 then he has this meeting with Adam and and they had met very briefly at a at a conference in India um, earlier in the year a startup conference where Adam spoke and um, but this was really the first time um, that that Masa had even been in a WeWork you know he kind of knew about the business but it wasn't something that that SoftBank thought about you know they were they were a tech company the Vision Fund which they had just started was was focused on artificial intelligence it was not focused on real estate and. Um, so yeah, Masa came for this this quick tour. Um, you know, Adam took him to WeWork's R and D lab um, to kind of show the techie side of the company. And you know, these were things like a, like a smart phone booth that you know changed temperatures, or a desk that automatically went up and down. I mean, we're going back a couple of years. These were mild innovations, but this was not moving us toward the singularity or, or anything like <laughs> Far that. Far from. I mean, come on. Like, it's a little bit laughable that like your your technology is like phone booth based and like standing desk. I mean, I'm here at a standing desk. Like <laughs> having the standing desk stand when I get in front of it is is not innovation. Well, I mean, this is the truth is I wouldn't say Adam was a Luddite, but he was not like a tech driven guy. He was a sales no. guy. He was a hype man. Yeah, it's it's actually sort of safe to say. I mean, he he didn't really use a computer um, uh, it, it, at all. Um, Adam w is dyslexic. He's he's pretty severely dyslexic, and it's something he's talked openly about. And and so he's not the guy to sit there and send a bunch of emails. Um, mm -hmm. And and so you know, for better or worse, he he was he was not your typical kind of tech CEO. He was no. the guy who was going to. And, and, and to his credit, I think, um, he figured out what he was good at. And what he was good at was getting in a room and pitching whatever he's pitching to, to a group of people. Now, is this the moment where Masayoshi-san takes out his stylist and iPad or something and draws mm -hmm. a term sheet and signs it with him in the car? Yeah, sort of digital cocktail napkin agreement from, on this deal. And, and, you know, of course, these... You know, it's a story Adam and Masa love to tell because it, it especially on on the way up, um, it's it sounds like just this big bet that we're making that, of course, is is great. Of course, after that, there were months and months of diligence from yeah. from SoftBank and a lot of skepticism from sort mm. of the the sort of middle to upper ranks at SoftBank about why are we investing in this real estate company? A, a, a lot of pushback on it, but. Ultimately, as at WeWork, you know, as people told me, Adam got what he wanted when when there was something he had his mindset on. That's that's the same case at SoftBank, and Moss is pretty open about that. When he has a feeling about something, um, that's what's going to happen. And in the book, you're, um, I, I was trying to see, I was trying to guess your politics, uh, mm. and you seem to be a little judgmental about. Is the only part I felt you were a little bit judgmental about. The strategy of um, a lot of misses mm -hmm. are okay if you hit a home run. Mm. Do you think that that is a bad aspect of capitalism or a good aspect? Or are you indifferent about it? Are you a socialist? Are you a capitalist? How, how, how would you describe yourself when you look at capitalism and especially high growth startups? I think I think it's an okay model. It's it's a it's a risky model, right? Like it it, it you know going for home runs every time. Um, you know you you have a tendency, and I, I think sometimes the home you know this is, sports metaphor is going to fall apart. But sort of the the home runs, um, the, the ones that are successes can have kind of these unintended consequences. I mean, we worked for years was was a um, was a home run, and and now we're looking at kind of a situation where it it has sort of like uh, almost warped the sort of real estate world in in the way that you know softbank dumping all of this money into various industries has kind of warped these industries like how, how much are we actually willing to pay for a cab ride or our burrito to be delivered or office space we don't totally know because all of these services have been subsidized i mean you might not call it socialism but but it's not it's not capitalism at least at it's at its sort of rawest form and i think to think about like sort of the dangers of this i mean i remember there's there's a guy I, I quote in the book who was sort of a competitor of adams um and just talking about seeing him on the way up uh this this person was sort of you know an avowed capitalist um and he but he kind of said you know if, if adam is successful sort of the way we work played the game of kind of playing fast and loose growth at all costs that's all that matters um is this system actually like good is is the system as we've set it up like good for the broader society and i i don't have an easy 
uh, answer to that. I, I think clearly I'm, I'm a user of a lot of these services. Um, but I do think we have to grapple with exactly what all this money that sort of started sloshing around, particularly from the Vision Fund, and, and what that actually did to various industries. So in a way, what you're saying, if I can recap it is, sure. perhaps um, venture capital and the venture industrial complex um, feels efficient. But this layer that came on top of it, the Vision Fund, feels like maybe a perverted capitalism and, and the unintended consequences and it is maybe that's where it jumped the shark. I, I think that's fair. Like, I don't think this is a story about venture capital is evil. Um, I, I, I think that it, it produces a lot of, a lot of very good things and, and great companies. Um, but SoftBank pushed it to, to another level. I, I am curious to try to understand what the lessons will, what lessons will be taken from this, if any, um, part of me wonders if, if there will be any, and, and, you know, the fact that we work flamed out will just be, you know, a home run that fell short at the warning track sort of situation, as opposed to viewed as, as a total swing and miss. Yeah. What does your gut tell you? Uh, I think it's the former. I, th I think that there won't be lessons learned. I think, you know, people will will choose to kind of laugh at adam and 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 we work as a as a you know just something to kind of make fun of but you know you look at these cycles kind of repeat over and over again from the dot-com bubble that we talked about yep. to you know everything leading up to 2008 to this there there you know differences of course but when when people see the chance to take over the world in in various ways um you know it's it's going to be hard pressed to you know to not not do that all right, when we get back, I want to talk about the end, the end of the line okay. for, for Adam and how this all came apart. Uh, and then what is the possibility that Adam comes back and has a second act? And what, is the, what are the chances that we work actually that some value uh, comes out of the rubble when we get back on This Week in Startups? This Week in Startups is brought to you by Silicon Valley Bank. What's next? What if? Are we ready? Now what? These are the questions that can keep founders up at night. And no one understands this quite like Silicon Valley Bank. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped thousands of high growth companies by providing scalable financial solutions, along with the insights and expertise that many other banks just can't. From healthcare to hardware, software to infrastructure, Silicon Valley Bank works with companies across the innovation landscape at all stages of the journey, anticipating their needs before they do. And by providing access to insights and in-depth reports, SVB can help you make more informed decisions and assist in turning your great ideas into a great business, which could be why 50% of US-based venture-backed tech and life science companies bank with SVB. Will your business be next? Learn more at svb.com slash next. Silicon Valley Bank, built for what's next. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back. Uh, Reeves Weidemann's uh, Billion Dollar Loser is out. He talked to 250 people for hours and hours and hours. And it was pretty clear to people who worked for Adam that this was unsustainable and he was out of control. It was clear for people who were at SoftBank that he was out of control uh, and that this, you know, from rank and file people that this was a bad idea. Masayoshi san, though, when he wants to do something, does it. He has had the Midas touch. He has taken his own counsel and become the greatest investor in the history of investing up and down. Obviously, Mercurial lost, you know, close to $100 billion in net worth, <laughs> over $50 billion uh, in the dot com boom, and then came back and, you know, did the Alibaba deal and other deals that uh, make him pretty, uh, uh, crazy genius, as it were. Um, Adam's behavior became so deranged that the entire partnership of Benchmark flew out to try to rein him in at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how did you get that information on that story? And what actually, tell the audience what happened when Bill Gurley and the crew fly out to New York and sit Adam down and say, hey, pump the brakes. Yeah, well, and and this was, you know, truthfully before the SoftBank money even arrived. Yeah. It was it was sort of in this period where, you know, the negotiation was happening and and Benchmark was was dealing with this not only at um, 
at WeWork, uh, SoftBank was at the time talking to Uber as well and yeah. eventually made a gigantic bet there. And and the basic situation was um, there were some red, red flags. Um, there, one that you mentioned was the fact that Adam was selling so much of his stock uh, was something that he was already doing. Um, you know, a- Adam often gets compared to Travis Kalanick in, in various ways, just as kind of hard driving entrepreneurs of, of this era. Um, but, but Travis hadn't, hadn't sold his stock for, for all the Quite criticisms. The opposite. He wouldn't let yeah. anybody sell shares. He went out of his way <laughs> to not let us sell our shares in the company, yeah. uh, which, which was, may be his own issue, but well, it actually turned out to be very wise because the, the round mm-hmm. of investing I was in, um, the angel round, people did have the right to sell. Some people did uh, to their peril, and so they sold at four billion, and the company quickly became worth tens of billions. And those people felt really stupid when they did. Yeah. Um, and holding on, you know, and that's one of the great things about private companies is you know you kind of got to sit on your hands with the stock, and you can't make a stupid move like people often do when companies go public, which is a stock is going up and they sell it. Yeah. Stocks are going down, they hold it. It's you want to do the opposite. Stocks going up, you want to hold and. You know, it's hard to do, but well, and I think that you you get to kind of the issue there. So, so you know, in this meeting, they they pushed back on Adam on that front. They were worried about the growth of the company and worried that it was going to get out of control, especially once once the Vision Fund money came through. At the same time, and and for all of the problems that we were benchmark made out great. They made hundreds of millions of dollars on on their bet here. It was not the the billion plus that they might have hoped to make, um, but along the way. They sold shares too um, as SoftBank came in and and did well. And so, for all the ways that you would expect, you know, the proverbial adults in the room, whether those were the investors or kind of the sort of people who started to fill the executive ranks coming from big companies elsewhere, all of them, none of them were were really that incentivized to question Adam and what he was doing. Um, the stock kept going up and up, at least in theoretical value. Um, Adam's gambits continued to work. Um, and he was someone who was just very strong willed and, and pushing back on him, um, you know, was was not always well received. So I think some of these investors, even, uh, you know, the benchmarks, the smartest money's out there, when things are going well, sometimes even if even if your judgment is telling you to do something else, you, you kind of have to, you, you, you're willing to go along and and in this case, you know, they didn't have that much power um, uh, to, to he had super sort of voting shares. Adam. So he, yeah. he had so Adam, Adam had control of the company, which he had sort of wrested from from the other investors. So there was only so much anyone could do. Yeah, that I think is one of the legacies of all this, which is the super voting shares and not proper having proper governance is something that the Valley has definitely reconsidered mm-hmm. um, post Uber post. Adam Newman um, is, you know, let's make sure we have good governance here. And then, the, you know, the personal behavior. I mean, at some point, he was on a private jet smoking weed. Yeah. He was smoking weed in his office. He yep. was having these summer camps where my understanding was they were more Burning Man than corporate retreats. I think What that's did right. you hear about those? I mean, all of the stories are true, and and frankly, there's there's probably crazier ones that that I wasn't able to to dig up. Um, WeWork employees keep telling me more and more, even as they as they get their hands on the book and and stories that were even wilder. What, what, what was the nature of these? Uh, I mean, I used a colloquialism, Burning Man, but what, sure, what was happening it's, at it's these a lot of partying. summer camps? It's, it's a lot of partying. It's a lot of drinking. I mean, you, you, summer camp was in theory a, a corporate retreat. There were speakers during the day, but as we describe in the book, you know, at, at one point um, there was you know someone from UPS giving a talk about logistics for startups, and and you know the smell of marijuana was wafting over the crowd. I mean, this yeah. you know it, it was it was a great weekend, and and you know for for a lot of people a lot of employees at the company the people who went to these events it was the most fun they'd they'd had at at work or otherwise and and that was part of this sort of for a while it was part of the appeal of the company it was it was again like wanting to to have a keg in in your office as long as people are using it responsibly and and you can sort of spool out this metaphor of like it's all good and well when things are are going well and then suddenly when they're not then the fact that you have this expensive private jet um doesn't look like frugal governance and and in fact looks like the exact opposite even if at the time there was some justification for it yeah and the 
incessant partying and doing shots of tequila yeah. while working in the age of, you know, people being really uh, examining corporate behavior. Yeah. I mean, talk about a recipe for disaster when the founder is encouraging people to get sloshed, young people. I mean, what do you expect to happen? But harassment and, and HR nightmares during all yeah. of this. Um, and that emerged at, at WeWork, you know, it, it, um, I mean, there were stories early on of Adam, you know, he's walking around the office Tuesday, Wednesday night at, at midnight, encouraging people to stay late and work and pouring shots and handing out stock options to anyone who's like sticking around and willing to take a shot with him. Um, you know, you're, you're encouraging a certain amount of devotion yeah. uh, to him, which there is kind of a, a cultish aspect to WeWork, which, which many people have commented on. Um, but that goes off the rails. And I think uh, the final summer camp they had in 2018 um, in London uh, cost millions and millions of dollars. Um, and, and it started to not be fun anymore. It started mm. to be like, what, you know, I think the, the employees at the company kind of woke up and were like, what is, what's going on here? Like, why, why are we doing this? And so I think there was kind of a general sort of awakening at a certain point. I don't, did you watch this Nexium, The Vow, and have you been I haven't watching? Yet. Oh, it's pretty interesting when when you look at sort of WeWork and the cult of personality. It does feel like he was leading not an explicit cult, like intentionally, but yeah. people who were drawn to it were drawn to, you know, their friendships were all at work. Their entire yeah. lives were about WeWork, and he was pitching it as this was the future of. You know, we went from the iPod, the iPhone, the i generation to the Wii generation. It's quite clever yeah. Yeah. in a very like, I don't know, simplistic way, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. But his behavior and, and the way he ran the company was clearly deranged. And the self-dealing was the thing I always, you know, from the outside before the whole thing fell apart, I just felt like the self-dealing showed such a lack of awareness of how that stuff would be perceived. Yeah. He, he was licensing the trademark to the company. He was buying buildings and selling them back, to, renting them back to the company. He, was the, he had a surf company, like a wave machine company he bought. And then he, his wife was doing a school. She had no experience in education. Were, were, the, were these unchecked, you know, blank checks and self-dealing the undoing, do you think? Or was it something else? I think they're probably more symptoms of of other issues, and 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 maybe the bigger issue is sort of a blindness to to how, as you point out, how those things would be perceived. There's in each of those cases, there's a there's kind of a logic to it. If you if you want to tie yourselves in knots, I mean, you know, the the wave pool company, there was some thought that maybe we were could would create these giant kind of corporate retreat centers, and that part of that would maybe be a it would be a wave pool. But even just saying that now, you 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 sort of have can't help but kind of laugh at at, at the idea of it. Um, and so I think there was a, a certain lack of self awareness of of how these things would be perceived, how how it would change people's perception of the company, and and it definitely fed a feeling, especially towards the end of of you know that that the we revolution is not for everyone. That in fact there is a class of people that is is benefiting from this more than much much more than the rank and file and and that it was adam it was not just that it was it wasn't just adam it was adam and his friends adam and his friends and family and so again the the perception of that certainly fed this notion of of hypocrisy um in in what the company stood for and and what it actually did he was entitled uh and deranged i mean this is a level of entitlement where you're telling people it's about us it's about we but you're selling shares at an you know alarming rate you're self-dealing and you're you know grinding the janitorial staff i mean that was also instructive uh, i'm not a fan of unions necessarily um and I, I think that those have all you know kind of unintended consequences as well but he was paying the janitorial staff 11 bucks an hour they wanted 20 if this is such a great company maybe right. there's a way to meet halfway and there's right. this point in the story where you're telling him he's lecturing the striking janitorial staff, which is from an outsource firm, about how yep. he was the American dream yep. outside the building. It, I mean, this yeah. is deranged behavior. I mean, talk about a lack of self-awareness entitlement. Yeah, and, and Adam didn't grow up rich. You know, he had kind of a, a, a difficult childhood. His, his parents were divorced. He grew up in Israel. He, he bounced around a lot. 
um he he came into himself at at a, at a certain point um clearly uh, but then you know money and power do weird things to people and and he very very quickly entered kind of a, a very elite circle um and and he he always had confidence in himself he was he was cocky from from being a teenager even and and so you know once once you get a taste of success um you know it, it can do strange things to you and i mean you take the soft bank example all, all these people kind of wanted to s want to say you know oh, adam you you know if only we hadn't taken moss's four billion dollars and it's like well <laughs> who's who's gonna turn down you know four billion dollars there's this level at which you know a a you would like to think adam could have kept his head a little bit better but m so many people from all different directions were were puffing him up more and more yeah the 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 most interesting moment in the book for me that mm -hmm. was uh illustrative of his personal uh derangement well maybe you can guess it there's a moment when he's doing an there's activity a <laughs> there's a moment when he's doing an activity hmm. and it was so instructive of who this person is uh I, I need a. I need more of a hint. There's a lot of activities. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking he's of a doing jet ski a, moment. Yes, uh, you got it. You which got one? It. <laughs> well, there's mo the, the, okay. there's multiple jet ski moments. Yes. Are okay. We in so Hawaii or upstate New York? Yes, the Hawaii one is the most yep. for me. They, they, I mean, there's a surfboard and the jet ski <laughs> one. But tell tell the story of Hanalei Bay because sure. this to me explains exactly what a grifter entitled. I'm just going to say a douche that this guy was. I mean, you're very, you go in very level headed, but the, when, and, and you're, you're non judgmental. Um, a little judgmental about the sort of uh, strategy here in Silicon Valley, which we can get into, but you're very non judgmental of him. Mm -hmm. And it just, this moment just said everything to me. Hanalei Bay. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell the story of Hanalei Bay. Oh. Um, the, um, Adam had just closed the deal with SoftBank. Um, he'd gotten his $4 billion. Um, and Hanalei Bay is this uh, sort of surf mecca um, in Hawaii. And it's, it's a pretty sort of laid back, kind of eclectic place. You know, tons of very wealthy people, famous people go there. But, but the general ethos is you're going there to surf. You're going there to be a part of nature. You're going there to kind of chill out. Um, yes. Low key. Low key. Uh, Adam um, went over over the Christmas holidays. He he sort of had started to make a habit of of doing this, and he had gotten very into surfing. and And um, there were sort of two moments described to me by by two two um, you know startup people uh, who who were also there. Um, just happened to be vacationing, knew who Adam was, recognized him. And at one point, um, there was this moment where he, Adam was being sort of pulled out to sea by these two locals um, who were swimming him out uh, to where the good waves were. And he was just grabbing onto a rope and kind of holding them behind. And it was just sort of this, this metaphor of like, you know, surfing is supposed to be you kind of communing with nature and, and the effort is part of it. And it, it felt like it, as, as you know, these people described it, it was, it was sort of a metaphor for, for what happened with, with SoftBank, where you suddenly got this $4 billion that meant you didn't have to do the hard work uh, that comes with sort of a bootstrapping a company, which, which they had done in the earlier days. Um, the end of the story is the next day, Adam was also surfing uh, with some friends. Uh, they were out in Hanalei Bay, had a couple of boats and a couple of jet skis. Um, and and jet, jet ski surfing is this sort of unusual um it, it's typically done when there's giant waves if you if you have a giant wave that you want to catch you kind of need a jet ski to sort of pull you into it this was not that situation this was again a situation of not wanting to work that hard to, <laughs> for for the joy of it and cheating uh, cheating, Basically cheating. It's, it's it's certainly cheating sort of the values and ethos if not any yes. hard fa hard and fast rules um and uh adam gets pulled into a wave on on this jet ski and uh gets up on his board, surfs it to the end and sort of, you know, puts his arm out uh, to the side. Uh, I think we describe it as sort of like Christ the Redeemer. Stares yeah. up at the sky where a drone has been uh, filming uh, his, his every, every move. Um, and that is his celebratory vacation. Um, it's so deranged. And so when you think about the context of Kauai, 
the Garden Island of Hawaii, Hanalei Bay, which is the most beautiful, tranquil, easiest surf break in all of Hawaii, probably. In fact, Puff the Magic Dragon, this, the Peter, Paul, and Mary song, is based on Hanalei Bay in a land called Hanalei. Yeah, and so uh, Michael Crichton used to own three of the houses on the beach. And I used to rent one of them okay. <laughs> from well, Michael so Crichton. Well. Yeah. So I know it. And it is it is like you're saying, like you're supposed to be very low key when you're in Hawaii as somebody coming from the mainland and respectful. And this is such deranged, crazy behavior. If you were doing it in Long Island or Newport Beach, to do it in Hawaii is so disrespectful. To, to use other people to pull you through the wave in Hawaii I mean, it, it would be like, I don't know, killing a shark or something. Like, this is just unbelievably disrespectful of the aloha spirit of, yeah. uh, you know, Hawaii. Uh, and so, what do you think happens from this point? Do you, is there any save possible here? Because on the way out, they give, to get him out, he's such a shark, he gets paid a huge payment to leave while everybody else gets screwed. But they didn't pay him everything, right? There, there was a little clawback. Yep. And are they in a lawsuit over that? What's the latest on that? Yeah, there's been a couple of clawbacks. It, it we just learned this week. Um, I mean, roughly speaking, Adam got a got a billion dollar payout to leave the company, mm. and and there were various parts of that. Some were paying back loans that he had taken mm. out. Um, some of it was a consulting fee, a uh, mm. hundred eighty five million dollar consulting fee, to advise the business and partly to make sure he didn't go start a competitor ah. um and then there was a, a secondary offer that that he was they were going to buy uh, mm. a chunk of his stock along with along with other shareholders to roughly um uh be about be about a billion dollars uh that tender offer is stuck in a lawsuit softbank has said that that we work um has sort of reneged on mm. some terms of the deal there are they have cited um some uh, investigations being conducted by Ooh. several state attorneys general oh boy. Um, uh, that we don't mm. know too much about but but softbank has cited this to sort of hold up that end of the deal and then um just this week marcelo claré who is one of Moss's deputies at SoftBank and came in as the chairman of WeWork after Adam was pushed out, uh, says that they have not paid Adam all of that consulting fee. So uh, he, he's fine. Um, he, he did just invest uh, $30 million into a, a, a residential living company last week. So he has money to throw around, um, but he doesn't quite have the billion dollars yet. Yeah, see, it's very interesting. I thought his other idea that was very prescient and a huge winner was We Live. Mm. That was another great idea. It's it's a good. Uh, I'm skeptical of it, and I'm okay, living here. Okay, let's hash in, it out. Yeah, in New York, um, where uh, me and my cohort of people in their 30s, and I, I think most people, what we want is is the largest apartment we can possibly afford, and what what Adam was offering was the smallest apartment. You could possibly find, but I'm going to give you some common space to to sort of hang out with with people. Mm. Um, that uh, it's it's a nice idea. It's sort of based in in kind of the kibbutz that that Adam grew up in in, in mm. some ways. But uh, and, and and it might be nice if if humans were more open to spending lots of time with uh, the people, other people who live in their apartment building. But the ra the reality, at least in most cities, is that we all kind of. We all want our own spaces, um, for yeah. better or worse, and maybe even especially more now. Yeah, the pandemic does change that. I thought when I was in my 20s in Manhattan, when I was sleeping in my office at Sony, sure. and yeah. I would literally, because I had an apartment in, way out in Brooklyn, I would sleep under my desk two or three nights a week in a sleeping yeah. bag that I hid in my file cabinet in my tiny little closet office, and then I would shower in the gym. And yeah. so if I went out at night, I just tell people I'm going to the server room to reboot some computers <laughs> and I just sleep under my desk. And they just kind of like- <laughs> You might have liked that we room. live, yeah. And I thought we live was like pretty good for the 20s crowd. But then yes. again, back then, you didn't want to be in Brooklyn. Now you do want to be in Brooklyn. Back then, True. you wanted to be in Manhattan at all costs. So being able to stay in Manhattan overnight was like the, the huge goal. The okay, thing. As, yeah. as we wrap here, uh, Joey Cables. Yeah. My favorite mm -hmm. character in, in the whole- I think you got to tell this story of, of Joey Cables. This to me is like just super indicative of uh, 
how how poorly run this organization was at yeah times. I, th- I, th- I think to give a generous reading it's also you know it, think of the early days of any startup there are yes. weird characters that come in and out and and this is is kind of one of the stranger ones um joey cables was a 16 year old high school student um he lived on long island with his parents he went to school in the city at hunter college high school and he in 2010 um got an office at WeWork because he had a job basically providing kind of networking services to companies. He was sort of a just, a, a, you know, in, in some ways and, and, and friends and colleagues of his describe him as kind of a genius. He was, he was mm-hmm. sort of, um, uh, he was just really good at the job and, and really entrepreneurial. Um, his name's Joseph Sohn. Um, and he uh, was working at the original WeWork down in Soho um and uh one day miguel McKelvey, adam's uh co-founder needed some help with some wiring or, or the net the network was down knocked on joey's door and asked if he could help and uh he did and a few months later they offered him a f- full-time job at 16 years old as a high school student he dropped out um and and worked at we work for the next uh next few years so the the um first it director at WeWork, a company that aspired to become a physical social network was a 16 year old high school student incredible uh, that's the guy i want to meet i want to meet joey cables and find out what his startup idea is and back him that's the yeah. guy i want to give a hundred thousand yeah. dollar check to because <laughs> yeah there, that's the hustler there's always somebody in these stories who you, you know is that's the hustler idea and then as we wrap here there's other bullets i wanted to get to real quick lightning round billy mcfarland was a early we work sure um tenant and yep. ja rule played at a summer camp i believe and uh, <laughs> billy mcfarland of he course did at a, a summit, fire summit which was the winter the winter one Got yes it. yeah so both T- of tell the, us about uh, the, that, f- yeah. the two main the two main figures in the fire festival saga of course um intersected with WeWork. ja rule played a concert um one night for we work employees uh he did complain about his setup and seemed to try to sort of get out of it but he eventually played the set seems to be a theme um, in his and career billy was a yeah. tenant um mm. yeah a little bit um yeah. billy uh billy was a tenant with with his businesses um early on uh pre-fire festival um he had a few companies uh spling uh magnesis um and he had these offices at WeWork, and at, at one point he even talked to WeWork about selling magnesis which was sort of this clubhouse uh, credit card for millennials kind of idea that that got him into all kinds of trouble even before fire started but you know he and and he did uh, when i talked to billy in prison where he currently is um he he did say that he took some amount of inspiration from from adam as as sort of a pitch man and from WeWork as as kind of a company that that brought people together which is what he says he was trying to do with with fire yeah. that'll be interesting to see you know they have the paypal mafia interesting to see mm-hmm. what the we work you know diaspora it, comes up it, with in terms of crimes and frauds <laughs> over the decades <laughs> well there are there are a few companies i won't name them yet but i will i will i have them in the back of my mind where a number of ex we work people have sort of congregated in their ah. post we work lives um mm. so we'll see what happened there some are backed by softbank some aren't Ah. And the other thing that's happening is, you know, some of them have their, yeah, their own startups that they want to try. And, and a few told me, you know, they've been in touch with Adam um, and, and Adam has talked about he'd be interested in, in uh, uh, floating them some cash if, if, if that's something they're interested in. I don't think any wow. of them are quite ready to take him up on that, but I suspect there will be some kind of future for all of these people in one way WeWork or another. WeWork is a viable concern right now. They've got the money. They've... They, they've still got a business i guess we'll see post pandemic how that works does seem like actually the just happenstance closed offices would be the way to go in a mm. with the coronavirus versus an open office plan probably take your mask off inside the offices i think well mm. i don't know it's that mm. that's the proposition that they're offering i mean mm. you know these offices are closed but do you want to sit in a glass cube all day eventually you're going to go have to go out to the canteen uh-huh. and and yeah, go yeah, get yeah. your coffee or whatever it is they're certainly pitching themselves as as um the sort of flexible path forward in the pandemic of, yeah. of saying you know um 
saying to companies, you might not need your headquarters that you needed right. that you that you needed a year ago. You might not just need a place for employees to go every now and then or have meetings. And they're trying to pitch themselves that way. I think it's going to be a tough road ahead mm. just because the business was based on squeezing people in and yeah. as many people as they could, which is just not what you want now. So there's some reason for optimism, but I think they're trying to figure this out along with the rest of the commercial real estate world. And it's just going to be a, you know, and until people are comfortable coming back into an office, I don't yeah. see how any of these businesses are going to be going to be profitable or, or even survive. You, you, I mean, I hate to ask you to be a psychologist, you think this person is deranged, mentally ill, or you've used the word deranged a lot. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like the behavior, I would describe his behavior yeah. as deranged, like lighting a joint mm -hmm. in a business meeting, or asking for there be to be a cannabis <laughs> ventilation system in your offices, or lighting up on a flight. This is deranged behavior. I'm sorry. And like doing shots on the roof of a building when you're not supposed to go up on the building and then shooting the investors with a, you know, fire extinguisher. This yeah. is the behavior of a deranged person. Um, yeah. And I, I got to think that mental illness might be part of this. And it feels like this is not a story of somebody who is just an aggressive founder. And then we see him walking in the street in bare feet. I actually, and I don't think this forgives anything, but I do think that this might be a mentally ill person. Did you get, did anybody say to you, I think this person is bipolar? I think this person is manic? Because it seems like bipolar, manic behavior from the outside what did people tell you when yeah i think i'm going to take a pass on on medically <laughs> diagnosing adam the thing yeah. i'll say is that uh, there's a thin line between un deranged and unconventional and mm. and that line is basically success and and if you're if things are going well who cares if you w walk walk bare feet um in the office it's it's kind of a fun weird quirk um once things go badly, all these things look very different. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, that's, that's, I would say the generous reading, but I think, you know, Adam, Adam is a unique and unusual person. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, a, a, a more kind of conventional kind of person wouldn't have built this company, wouldn't have, wouldn't have pushed it to, I mean, there's examples of it, uh, y you know, that, that I, that I talked to throughout uh, mm -hmm. throughout reporting this of other people who ran similar businesses and they were just kind of content to um have you know half a dozen spaces i might have a space in new york and philly and boston and that's that's Done. good for me yeah um there's clearly something different about adam that made him want to to do the things that that he did and um what was know. the most uncharitable view that people took about him when they were talking to you in confidence about this, because obviously there are people who are close to him, like, yeah, I, and I don't expect you to, and I like actually the way you sort of summarize it. Like, it, you know, if you're successful, you can, it forgives a lot of eccentric behavior, right? Like you're just eccentric and successful, right? Okay, great. But what did his, the people close to him, what did they think was his sort of deal as it were? I talked to one, uh, I mean, truthfully, it, it depended. I mean, yeah. some people, some people really, um, you know, a, a, some people would tell me he didn't, he didn't care about the people around him. He didn't care mm -hmm. if there were sort of, you know, bodies underneath the train as, as it, as it moved forward. And that was a critique. And then I would hear stories of, of sort of great kindnesses that, that he would mm -hmm. do to, to people. So that, that sort of complicated this picture. And, and one, um, you know, one, uh, of his, um, executives kind of put it to me sort of in this uh in a particular way that i thought was was useful of, of thinking about like there was a part of adam that was you know something like 25 percent ego 25 percent generosity and I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna forget what the other percentages was but it was like which 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 side of him is gonna win on any given day and and that's kind of the battle we face on you know that all of us face but but adams just seemed to have these more forceful sides of his personality that that would win out and sort of dominate the day yeah i think it's narcissistic personality disorder bipolar i can i can diagnose this from a mile away <laughs> uh, I'll, let you, I'll, let, I'll let you do it yeah <laughs> you're a journalist you gotta be just based on my experience investing in 200 companies and having friends in this like uh if you if you think about this specific you know condition 
an inflated sense of self-importance check uh, a deep need for excessive attention and admiration check troubled relationships check mm -hmm. a lack of empathy for others half check like some people felt that way some people didn't um but behind that massive extreme confidence lies a fragile self-esteem that's vulnerable to the slightest criticism is that was he did he take the criticism personally do you think people did tell me that you know it's not like adam was just walking around uh constantly brimming with confidence that he was actually could be a very anxious person and and behind the scenes was was nervous before big meetings or big presentations sometimes um marijuana helped with that sometimes just getting in the room and getting in the flow uh helped with that so you know uh, yeah it's 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 not as simple as saying he was just kind of always on like i, I think in many ways, he dealt with all this, a lot of the same anxieties that we all do, and and mm. his way of responding to it was to sort of go out and be kind of this charming, confident person. Confidence man, grifter. Like, he did yeah. get pumped up for the meetings. That was the interesting part. You, he had mm -hmm. these tremendous anxiety and feelings of doubt when he was going into meetings, that he was desperate to get a meeting with Elon to talk about. Mm -hmm. I'll end on that. That was bizarre. We work Mars. We work Mars. Yeah, he, they had a meeting at SpaceX in in LA um, a few years back, and yeah, you know, Adam, this was kind of part of the whole game of wanting, uh, you know, wanting the constant company to constantly be shooting for something bigger, which which has its merits, and in this case, it was Earth is not enough. Mars is is where we're headed, and and once Elon gets us there, we're we're going to build the community. Uh, that that keeps the uh, the astronauts uh, sane um, once they're up there. Um, Elon uh, was late to that meeting, much as Masa was late to his meeting with Adam. Um, but it ended very quickly, and and with Elon pretty quickly dismissing Adam and saying, you know, it's actually getting there that is the hard part. We'll deal with with the rest of it, and and we'll figure that out once we once we get the yeah. hard part done. I thought that was like, you know, just knowing Elon, like he doesn't suffer fools, and like yeah. the idea that. This dipshit's going to be like, you know what, Elon, the hard part is not getting to Mars. The hard part is creating a community on Mars. And Elon's like, no, that's incorrect. It was great to meet you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, that's what happened. My, my sense from not being in the room is that is more or less what happened. Yes. And, and I think that speaks volumes. Uh, listen, uh, congratulations on your first book, Billion Dollar Loser. Everybody go Thank buy you. it. Uh, if you like it, write a review. It, it's really great. Who's your publisher? Oh, Little Brown. Little, Little Brown. Wow, very well done. Little Thank Brown, you. the uh they got a lot of New York. I, I is that Malcolm Gladwell too? Is on Little Brown? Uh you're you're testing my knowledge of of the publishing I think was, universe I think which I don't it. know. So yeah. that, that that may anyway. be the case, but Yeah, it's not like a boutique imprint for uh those New York elite uh <laughs> <laughs> New Yorker writers. Thanks for being guilt, so guilty candid. as charged. Guilty yeah. as charged. Continued success and uh, everybody go buy the book and if you like it write a review if you don't like it uh yeah don't write a review don't, don't write a review please <laughs> go write a review all right listen great job and uh, uh good luck on your pandemic book tour i know it's a bit of a bummer to not be able to go on tour but they don't have budgets for that anyway anymore yeah so who needs it it's more we, fun just sitting here talking to you so we we both missed the book tour budget <laughs> of these things there is yeah. no budget for that anymore yeah uh, that was like a thing in the 90s where like i know the good they old would days. literally send you around the world and and you would go to book readings and all right listen continued success and we'll see you all next time on this week's service bye bye <laughs> <laughs>